Churches. Oh, well, thank you, Sonia. God bless you. Amen. Okay, I, yeah, I know. Between Sonia, Sandra's purse and Sonia's car, anything you need is there. Amen. That's a good thing to have no people like that. At least I know you. Amen. Okay, Jeremiah is forty-one and forty-two. We're gonna we're going to do both of them today, and we're gonna finish all fifty-two chapters by the end of the year, and we will finish our assignment. Yes. And for me, it's been a great joy. And um, I remember when I talked the book of John hadn't been that long ago, and when I finished the book of John, I just was so sad. You know, I was just like, oh, I'm just gonna miss this book so much. And, Joanne Carpenter said, well, it's still in the Bible, but there's a difference. When you're soaking in a book and you're taking each scripture and you're, you know, you're soaking in them, you kind of become one with that book. So I was thinking last night, Lord, this may be the last time I'll preach the book of Jeremiah, but it sure, thank you so much for letting me preach it, and thank you all for being faithful to, to follow this before the Lord is leading us. Okay, and we could write a book with these two chapters. And only the wisdom of the Lord can guide me to teach it. There is so much to cover. I'm not going to teach uh, each scripture. I'm just going to kind of talk about the scriptures. After the siege of Jerusalem, and when the war had waned, <laughs> we can say the war has waned in Afghanistan maybe, but the war is still going on, okay? Um... Israelites from distances began gathering in Mizpah, which Nebuchadnezzar had set up as a haven for refugees and the forlorn. It was to be a safe haven city under the Chaldean rule. But evil plots found their way to its gates to continue to destroy the uh, Israeli people and the call that God had on them. And I just want to mention, and I'm sure y'all saw it already, that uh, GW, Jeb, Laura, the Obamas, and the Clintons have joined forces to help Soros uh, relocate uh, the Afghanis into the United States of America. Mm -hmm. Joined forces with Soros. So I just want to evil plots are still about among, amongst us. These evil plots are, just keep on working. Um, and the plot was unknown to Gadaliah. Uh, for Johanan, the son of Korea, warned him. And Johanan was one of the oath takers with Gadaliah. And as we read last week, in chapter 40, he even offered to assassinate Ishmael, who had the plan to uh, to kill Gedaliah. But Gedaliah would not believe Johanan's report. And at this time, no one consulted Jeremiah. Now, if I've got a threat against my life, 
And so, someone, when you comes to me and tells me that somebody's going to kill me, okay, which was kind of the situation. It was someone very close. Johanna was very close to God alive. He come to him and he said, uh, Ishmael's got a plot to kill you. I believe I'd have gone to Jeremiah since Jeremiah had been sent there uh, by uh, the captain of Nebuchadnezzar's army to kind of help these people. Or that's what he chose to do. They didn't. So this continues to be part of the problem throughout these two chapters. <laughs> and when they finally did consult the Lord through his prophet, they did the opposite of what the Lord told them to do, which has been the pattern of this generation of Jews, is they have continually, the prophet would give the word and they would do the opposite. Gedaliah could not believe that one of the men who took an oath with him would fight against him. Like David of old, he could not comprehend why his friend and bosom confidant would turn against him, but he did. Okay, at this point, every loved person that you have, including your husband, including your children, whatever area that the devil has that he is able to get to that person, the devil will use it to get at you mm -hmm. if you give that person power. Nice. And no matter how much you love someone, do not give the demon in them power over you or you have made an idol out of that person. Amen. So, the great overriding truth remains that man is cursed who puts his trust in man. And I did not put the scriptures here, but there's at least seven or eight scriptures that confirms that statement. And one thing for sure Ishmael wanted to rule and would kill to obtain that rule. It is through the, this line that all of Islam still flows. He was from Jordan. The Heshemite kingdom of, of Islam, uh, the, Jordan is still the head of it. So even though Jordan seems like a moderate a uh, nation, that spirit, is still there. It's still the head of the Heshemite kingdom, and Islam still, Islam still flows from there. Okay, so the word says, in the seventh month of the Jewish calendar, Ishmael is described of the royal family. And with him were ten of the officers of the kingdom. And this is where the Spirit of God took us off last week, because we aligned that ten with... Um, the law of sin and death. They came to Mizpah and ate bread with Gedaliah, who had been ruling as governor only two or three months. Ishmael struck Gedaliah with the sword and killed him. Just got up from the table and knocked him out. Mm. You ever sat at a Thanksgiving table or a Christmas table with a big bunch of family and somebody took the sword at you? <laughs> They might have just had it, might have been just a, a knife, but, you know. They also struck down all the Jews who were with him and the Chaldean men of war who were there at the time. So Ishmael is now in trouble with Nebuchadnezzar. He knows Nebuchadnezzar's going to be coming at him, too. Then Ishmael entices 80 men. They're on their way to worship the Lord. They're carrying in, the Word of God says, they're carrying in their hands incense and offerings on the way to the house of the Lord, going there to worship Him. Ishmael goes out from his paw to meet them, weeping. Tell, I mean, like he's worshiping with them, because they're all lined up, the way Scripture describes it, and they're carrying their offerings, and they're on this journey into, the, into Jerusalem to worship. Okay, but he goes out weeping like he's going to be part of them. And he entices them to go meet that alive. Now, he's already killed that alive. This is the method of hypocrites. And those spoken of by Jude and Simon Peter, who cautioned the end time church about the presence of hypocrites and how they will entice you to go off and follow. Uh, where God is not sending you. Mm. 
Ishby outfield trenches, pits, with the dead bodies of those and those of he and his henchmen murdered. It meant nothing to him that innocent human life was taken. We're getting bits and pieces of information out of the Taliban and Afghanistan, and it seems that I heard, I saw one report, and it was Epic Times, and they're pretty accurate, um, that they had three men hung out in the city square. Yeah, they hung three men out in the city square. No, nothing to, nothing to them. Human life means nothing to them. This is that same spirit. I'm talking about the same spirit of Ishmael that we're dealing with in this chapter. That we're dealing with with the Taliban. Verse 8. The ten men were found among them who said to Ishmael, Do not kill us, for we have treasures of wheat, barley, and honey in the field. So he desisted and did not kill them among their brethren. Okay, this is a situation where you buy them off, a political buy-off. But, you know, I would do that to, to, if it, to outsmart someone who was trying to kill me, if that was their weakness. You know, they were trying, Satan was trying to kill me, I'd be outsmarting Satan if I could. You're supposed to outsmart Satan, you know. He can't read your mind. He only watches your actions and listens to your words, but he can't read your mind. 41.10 Ishmael carried away captive all the rest of the people who were in Mizpah, the king's daughters and all the people who remained in Mizpah, who Nebuchadnezzar, that remember that was, he was the head of the uh, Nebuchadnezzar's royal guard, the captain of the guard, had committed to Gedaliah and the sons of Aachim. You know, this Zebrah Zeradan, and all of his actions that's described in the Bible, yeah, this was a good man. Mm -hmm. And he intended good. That, there's not anything negative said about him in the Bible that I've found so far. Uh, all of his intentions were good. So Ishmael carried him away captive and departed to go over to the Ammonites, and that would be Jordan. Soon, however, the hunter began the hunted as Johanan, one of the field fighters for Israel, heard about the crimes. He pursued Ishmael and his gang, but by this time, God's people had been pirated away. Now, among those captives were the daughters of the king Zedekiah, and they had to be rescued. So God's great plan for future generations would be fulfilled, but we'll study that next week. That'll be in our study in chapter 43. I'll put the wonderful study. I love following it out. And the last time I taught Jeremiah, I remember that I did. Last night I looked it up just a little bit. And one of them married an Irish prince. And anyway, they became part of the royal, uh, of being in position to help the Jews. And they did. Um, it, it's, uh, I love, I'm not interested in royalty, but I'm interested in government. And when I read how these royals married and intermarried and how God set up governments, uh, it, it's fascinating to me uh, how these governments are all so connected. So that's pretty good rain, but we're safe. Y'all feel safe? Yeah. These steel beams aren't going to go anywhere, I can tell you that. <laughs> I, maybe this is the ladder, the sound of the ladder run. <laughs> I asked the Lord to show up today, which I...
Dutch will get her caught out before she can still get it out. Okay, so that
And as the Lord has been leading me in my daily reading, uh, yesterday morning I was in Deuteronomy 17, 16. And he shall not multiply horses for himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses. For the Lord has said to you, you shall not return that way again. Don't tell me that was an accident that I ran into that scripture. I would not have found it. I just read it uh, yesterday morning. Once God delivers us from one place, one is never to return there again. Egypt had been a great place of refuge in the past. Abraham was there due to the famine in Canaan. Joseph suffered there, but rose to power under the hand of the Lord. Moses was born there and delivered a nation. And after the children of Israel escaped with Moses, Egypt was a repository for much treachery. Solomon made a treaty with Egypt and thereby married Pharaoh's daughter, making an alliance which proved to be a spiritual downfall. You see, he disobeyed God. Do not return to Egypt. The stories of Hadai, Rehoboam, Jeroboam, and Hosea, separately, all separate stories, fleeing to Egypt, all ended in their destruction and it ended in their loss of their spiritual soul as well as their physical bodies. So after Moses' deliverance from Egypt, with the exception of Joseph and Mary's flight there, out of Egypt I call my son. Well, he also called Israel out of Egypt, and he called Jesus out of Egypt. But he calls us out of Egypt. Egypt is the carnal mind, the world system. God's emphasis throughout Scripture was always in coming out of the land. Egypt was pagan, animalistic, spiritism, state where witchcraft and darkness were invasive. Just living there tainted the mind. I know Christians who have come out of this stuff. And they say, I can go minister to them now. You don't go into their territory to minister to them. They have to come out for you to Amen. minister to them. If you go in, it's going to take you over again. You hear me? you got to be really strong to be able to go in without that spirit attacking you again because it had you one time. In other words, it says, I had you once. I'm going to try it again. It will try you. So I think to you out there, if y'all ever been in that and you think you can go in and deliver everybody out of it, they have to come to you. Yeah. And then you can deliver them out of it. Amen. Egypt was always an easy option in the mind of the rebellious. From the time of Israel's deliverance to the present, going to Egypt represented a rebellion against God. Still does. Going back into the world system because Christianity is too hard. The walk, I've heard it, y'all heard it? The walk of the Christian is too hard. So rebellion says, I'm going back to the world because it was easier in the world than it is being a Christian. Well, that, well in this world you will have trials and tribulations but being good cheer the Lord has overcome the world Amen. that doesn't mean I want to go back in the world and be part of that system I want to go with the one who overcame the world system Amen. Amen. now we're going to have battles but we've got to be strong enough to be a Christian you've got to be strong enough to be a Christian I've had people say to me, they fell. And more than one, I can tell you, I, I, they fell because it was too hard to be a Christian. That's the spirit of rebellion. Because they wanted their own way, and if they followed the Lord, that was too hard. Johanna and 
and Company now give the appearance of being humble and decided it's a good time to go see the prophet Jeremiah. Now, after all this, I think we better go see Jeremiah before we move to Egypt. I'm going to read the whole of verses 1 through 6. It's all funny. It's not funny, does it? Because we deal with it all the time. <clears throat> Now all the captains of the forces, Johanan, uh, Jethaniah, and all the people from the least to the greatest came near and said to Jeremiah the prophet, Please let our petition be acceptable to you and pray for us to the Lord your God. For all this remnant, since we are left but a few of many, as you can see, spirit of self-pity there, that the Lord your God may show us the way in which we should walk and the things we should do. Then Jeremiah the prophet said to them, I have heard indeed. I will pray to the Lord your God according to your words. And it shall be that whatever the Lord answered you, I will declare it to you. I will keep nothing back from you. So they said to Jeremiah, let the Lord be a true and faithful witness between us. If we do not, if we do according to everything which the Lord your God sends us by you. I've heard these words, folks. And then in, in six months, I've seen them turn the other way. Because they, they didn't like what the word of the Lord was. Whether it is pleasing or displeasing, they're still talking. We will obey the voice of the Lord our God to whom we send you, that it may be well with us when we obey the voice of the Lord our God. But see, they're manipulating. They're trying to manipulate Jeremiah, and they're trying to manipulate God. Johanan is in way over his head. Way over. Now remember, he was, um, I forget what his position was, but he wasn't like very high up in the king's government. But he is now, okay, because he was helping get a lot. Jeremiah knows they were feigning humility. And Jeremiah spoke their words back to them. I've got a whole sermon on this. I will pray to the Lord your God according to your words. Now you don't go before God with your words. That's the first thing you don't do. You, you say, God, just let me have your words. I want what you want. And if I don't want, we, we said there was a good thing that we shared Sunday night that David Wilkerson wrote, wrote. And he said, we just need to let pray and ask God to just to override us. Just lay back and let God override us. And I, that's just my total prayer. God override me. And just take over the whole situation. If we can ever get there, we'll be, probably make more progress than we've made. So Jeremiah says he will petition the Lord using Johanan's words. And they had already made up their mind what, that they were going to Egypt. They had no intention of obeying the word of the Lord if it did not agree with their plans. Their request to Jeremiah is hypocrisy at the highest level. This is a warning to us today. If you've already made up your mind what you're going to do, do not go to a prophet and request the word of the Lord. You're going to be in trouble. Now, if he's reading your soul and wants your favor, you might be able to manipulate him. But both of you are in trouble then. <laughs> when I realize someone's using my gift to try to get a word that will confirm what they have decided to do, I won't prophesy to them. I will only speak what I feel God is saying when a person is truly seeking God, asking God, and they want to know what God wants to know, or they're looking for a confirmation. 
If your decision is from the Lord, he will confirm it. But if it is not, then we must obey or come into judgment. Prophecy is not a parlor game like playing Ouija board. The word of the Lord is a serious matter. Until we obey the first directive, we will not be given another one. If God gives you a directive, and he tells you to do something, but maybe you thought you were, you needed a bigger platform than that, or maybe you thought you were more important than what he called you to do, or maybe your ambition was to be more important than what God asked you to do. If you don't do the small thing that he asks you to do, you're never going to get the big thing that you think that's what you're called to do. Word of the Lord is a serious matter. They asked Jeremiah to approach the Lord, your God. And these people were the remnant of Judah. They sound as if they had been worshiping a different deity from the God of Jeremiah. They probably were. Jeremiah promised two things. He would sincerely pray regardless of the time recall required, and he would bring them the exact answer given him, withholding nothing. I don't think Jeremiah was duped by their declarations. He had been a prophet used of God many years, and declarations of faithfulness like this had a hollow ring. I've had people come to me, and I love them, I love them, Today, if I don't see them, but I do, you know, occasionally. Pastor, I just love you and the way you preach. And I, oh, Pastor. And, and seven months later, they're gone. Okay, they may have loved the message that day. And they might even love me. But what pulled them away was whatever Satan had hold of them with. And I, but I don't, I don't, I'm not, a, I don't take any of that personal. I, 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 none of it I take personal. I just know it's human nature and that you love them when they love you and you love them when they don't love you. You love them when they like you and they, you love them when they're mad, whatever. You don't do anything out of personal feelings. If you do, the devil's got you. Whatever you do out of your personal feelings, the devil's got access to you. Uh, he'd been used by God for many years. And declarations of faithfulness like this one had a very hollow ring. Now, they, they came into covenant with God with the words they spoke. Let the Lord be a true and faithful witness. Now, see? They, issued, they entered into covenant with God. They spoke covenant. With God as witness, things could get complicated. Okay? You talk to God like that. As God, you heard people say, as God is my witness. As God is my witness. You be careful. It Amen. Can get complicated. They said, everything you command, we will obey. They knew that tied to obedience was a, was a blessing, that it may be well with us when we obey. Except there's something else pulling on. Something else pulling on. For 10 days, the prophet sought the Lord diligently in prayer and suffocation. In verse 7 is a phrase repeated many times in Scripture, and I looked it up last night to see how many times it was in there. It's awesome. I just love to do a whole teaching on and it happened. When it's written, and it happened. Oh, my goodness. You look at that in your concordance. Put it in your computer and see what shows up when and it happened. That means God of glory just got himself into the situation and it happened. <laughs> glory to God. Uh, God just moved into the situation. So start with verse 7. 
And it happened. <laughs> and it happened. After 10 days. After 10 days. Jeremiah prayed for 10 days. Seeking the Lord. To get a right. To get a right word of the Lord on this. The word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah. Then he called Johanan and all the captains of the forces uh, which were with him and all the people from the least even to the greatest. He had a big congregation there. I don't know how many was left. And he said unto them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, unto whom you sent me, to present your supplication before him. These people are in so far over their head, they don't even know what they're doing. If you will still abide in this land, then I will build you and not pull you down, and I will plant you and not pluck you up. For I repent of the evil that I have done unto you. Be not of the afraid, afraid of the king of Babylon, of whom you are afraid. Be not afraid of him, says the Lord. For I am with you to save you and to deliver you from his hand. And I will show mercies unto you and cause you to return to your own land. But if you say, we will not dwell in this land, neither obey the voice of the Lord your God, saying, no, but we will go into the land of Egypt where we shall see no war, nor hear the sound of the trumpet, nor have a hunger of bread, and there will we dwell. And now, therefore, hear the word of the Lord, remnant of Judah. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, if you wholly set your face to enter into Egypt and go to sojourn there, and it shall come to pass that the sword which you feared shall overtake you there in the land of Egypt. And the famine whereof you were afraid shall follow close after you there in Egypt, and there you shall die. So shall it be with all the men that set their faces to go to Egypt. To sojourn there, they shall die by the sword, by the famine, and by the pestilence. And not one and, and one of them shall remain, not one of them shall remain or escape from the evil that I will bring upon them. Church, this is where we are right now. There is the that your government is trying to put fear on you. Fear <laughs> that you, there won't be enough of food, fear of hunger, uh, fear of going to lose your money in the stock market. Fear that you're going to die of the plague. Mm -hmm. Fear of, of uh, taking medications or not taking medications. Fear of the government taking you over. Fear of everything. The spirit of Egypt is putting this fear on you and telling you, if you will come unto me, you will not have to fear these things. If the church goes to the world system, to look for their provision, these things will come up on you. No. Nope. We are going to have to keep our focus totally on the Spirit of God in these days that are ahead. Amen. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, as my anger and my fury has been poured forth upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so shall my fury be poured forth upon you when you shall enter into Egypt and shall be ex executed, loathed, hated, and an astonishment and a curse and a reproach, and you shall see this place no more. summation of this treatise is don't go to Egypt. I could have named this don't go to Egypt. But then I liked it better. I called it God put it all on the table. God spread it all on the table. It was all out there. Your choice. It's still there. 
But if you don't go to the word of God, if you don't go to God, if you don't see what the word of God says, then you're not gonna you're gonna be doing it your way. We've got to stay in the word of God. People say, give me an easy believism. Well, there's going to be a people that's going to make it through these. It took Jeremiah 10 days to get the word of the Lord. We live in a microwave. Give me the word of the Lord right now. I mean, I'm in a hurry. I've got things to do and places to go, but I need to hear it right now. Jeremiah didn't go to the Lord for himself. He went for these people. We can hear God's offer of mercy to a broken people. Did you hear his offer of mercy? I'll take care of you. I'll make every provision for you. I will bless you. I repent of the evil that I have brought upon you. I will love you if you'll just stay here. Yeah, that same mercy is extended to everyone who will turn to Jesus Christ in these days that are upon the earth, and I don't care what nation you're in. I speak to people in Pakistan who contact me, and all the nations that I hear from in Africa, different nations. I know y'all are going through hard times, and I get letters from you asking for me to support your ministry. I can't support all your ministries. There's no way. I can't to support all the people that are out there. But I can tell you what you can do is what we do. We go to Jesus Christ and he supplies all of his, our needs according to his riches and glory. He will do the same thing for you. And the same mercy that he offered Israel, he's going to offer it to you. It is yours. But you cannot go with the system of government or the system of the world that is in your land. You have got to follow Jesus Christ and he will lead you to a safe harbor. Amen. Glory to the Lord. They were to remain in the land of promise. Knowing they had discussed and had already decided to go to Egypt. The sovereign knew their hearts feared Nebuchadnezzar. So he said, I will show you mercy that he, the king of Babylon, may have mercy on you. Remember, Nebuchadnezzar is under God's hand right now. God raised Nebuchadnezzar up as his instrument of judgment. He, and the Bible says so. Nebuchadnezzar was his instrument of judgment, that he was bringing judgment to every nation that, Je that Nebuchadnezzar uh, captured. Nebuchadnezzar was under the hand of God. Nebuchadnezzar was listening to God. Nebuchadnezzar kept offering Israel, if you will do this, I will bless you. I will bless your nation. And they disobeyed every time. So God still has his hand on Nebuchadnezzar. Now, the time comes. When Nebuchadnezzar <laughs> goes out to pasture, literally, <laughs> literally, <laughs> the Lord knows our fears. He knows where we are weak and ir irresolute. He is not taken by our declarations and pronouncements. They're just as hollow as the Israelites were. God, you give me that million dollars and I am going to give you a hundred thousand. <laughs> God, I, I'm going to do this as soon as I get that. No. Not many. Not many. No. Heard it. But the, but the intent is there. He knows where we're weak and he shows us mercy anyway. He knows they are merely fleshly expressions as weak as Simon's pledge to Jesus. And thank goodness for Simon Peter. If they would obey him, Jehovah gave his solemn assurance of his personal attention to all their needs. 
the personal attention of God. And that's what you and I, that's what we have. As Christians, we know how to cry, cry up on Daddy's lap. We know how to go before God and tell him that, that, how, what our needs are and that he will personally take care of us. And we live under his care. Don't you live like that? I do. And he does. 19 through 22. The end of chapter 42. Almost. The Lord has said concerning you. This is still Jeremiah prophesying. Oh, you remnant of Judah. Do not go into Egypt. Know certainly that I have admonished you this day. For you dissembled to go astray, to seduce, to deceive in your hearts. See, they intentionally, okay. They intentionally and purposely came to Jeremiah to seduce him, to validate what they wanted to do. And to deceive Jeremiah to get him to do what they wanted him to do. And in so doing, seduce God and deceive him. But they really didn't care what God had to say. They wanted Jeremiah to say it so that they that would give them an okay. Y'all listening to me? In your heart, for you, for you dissembled to go astray, to, to, to seduce, to deceive in your hearts. When you sent me unto the Lord, your God, saying, pray for us unto the Lord our God. And according to all that the Lord our God shall say. So declare unto us, and we will do it. And now I have this day declared it to you. But you have not obeyed the voice of the Lord your God, nor anything for the reason he has sent me unto you. Now, therefore, know certainly that you shall die by the sword, by the famine, and by the pestilence, in the place where you desire to go and to dwell. Jehovah developed a scenario for them that included his wrath and their death by the three horsemen, Famine, sword, and pestilence. He told them if they went to Egypt, they would experience the same destruction of life and property as he poured out in Jerusalem. This promise included everyone, every man, woman, and child. You say God's not going to kill an innocent child. Well, all through the Old Testament, they did. He promised to make them an oath composed of astonishment, curse, and reproach. He promised they would never turn to their beloved land. God's offer was on the table, and the prophet had delivered it in exactness. Be careful when you go before the Lord. After ten days before the Lord, Jeremiah calls them hypocrites. Mm -hmm. Jeremiah had been inquired of by many political professionals during the years of his ministry. I wondered, you know, to Donald Trump's credit, he surrounded himself by ministers, by ministries, and by prophets. Mm -hmm. He surrounded, and we prayed, I prayed for prophets, that they would not prophesy to him what he wanted to hear. Mm -hmm. But they would speak to him what God said. He was going through a hard time he needed to hear a clear word of the Lord, and it was going to be hard words of the Lord. Mm -hmm. I mean, no prophet could tell everything's going to be okay today. That would be a lie from God. Everything was never okay any day of his presidency. Mm -hmm. Every day of his presidency was a battle just to stay alive. Yeah. Every day through two impeachments, that Mueller thing, but, but like we said, Mueller's name has become a reproach. Infamous. Mueller's name has become infamous, infamous with a false uh, accusation. 
Here he was, supposed to be a great, great uh, attorney, great, man, great law, man of law and constitution. But because he attached his name to this illegal action, his name become infamous. Today we're talking about serious business. We've got serious times going on out here. We're not just going to church anymore and you're sweet little ladies. Hmm? Sweet little ladies in this church. Oh no, it's not just sweet little ladies anymore going to Bible study. I'm talking about serious business going on in this world and we better get serious with it. Mm -hmm. That's what Jeremiah was talking about. Kings and priests had stood before Jeremiah seeking the word of the Lord. Johanan was presumptuous and he was arrogant. To think he could stand before God's prophet and manipulate the prophet or manipulate God. His position went to his head real quick. He didn't get in that position until that lie had been killed. He wasn't put there by the prophet. He just took it over because he was the one standing there in charge. And he starts running things and God hadn't even put him in charge to start with. And the prophet surely had not put him in charge. Jeremiah is here facing down the dereliction of the human will. That's a mouthful. That's a mouthful. But he's doing it in what's left of the people of Israel, the remnant. And when we go to chapter 43, they turn on Jeremiah harshly. Just like their kings, they accused Jeremiah of speaking falsely and that he did not give them the word of the Lord, but that he had spoke wrong to them. And then we will see that they were all destroyed. Glory be to God. Lord, the rain stopped. Amen and amen. Jenny's looking up scripture. You got a scripture for us, Jenny? Carrie? story, but they had already, one of the daughters, I believe, now well, I'll go into it next week because I have researched this in 2009 and I looked it up a little bit last time. Jeremiah took them to Europe. The story goes. And one of the stories, now, now none of this is totally, some of it, you know, we don't know for sure. One of the daughters had already married a prince from um, Ireland because they had ambassadors from the royal houses go in and out of the countries like they do now. You know, they had ships. It wasn't that big of a of an instant. And a, a prince from Ireland had already come, and that Zedekiah's daughter was married to him. I, one of the stories is that Jeremiah escorted them to Europe. Yes. Yeah. Stone is still there. Uh huh. Yeah. Now we'll have to wait till I get into this next week because I haven't. I didn't go look at my four notes. I did in fourth year, but I did address this. I did do it in two thousand nine. Uh, but last night I looked up and I there seemed to be a little bit more information out there than I had in two thousand. But I didn't go into it. I just remembered the story. No, so really, but God, but God used them, according to what I saw last time. Uh, a son of this Irish prince became a ruler, made to say Ireland, and he saved the Jews from another attack where they.
they would have been destroyed. And this was the Jews from the, for the Messiah would come from the Jews that came back from Babylon. This was the Jews for the Messiah was coming from. And this Irish prince was in the right place to save them from being wiped out. Amazing. Now, let me get my story straight. Y'all getting me ahead here on my story. made himself a ruler and nobody put him in there. That's right. He just was presumptuous to take over. Never went to Jeremiah to pray about anything. He took over after Gedaliah was killed. Now he did try to save Gedaliah in all fairness and he went to save all of the Israelites. But then he, when he, he got presumptuous and arrogant and he was, he was never put in place. As God, he was not put in place by Nebuchadnezzar, who they were under. He was not put in place by Jeremiah, and he was not put in place by God. No anointing. No anointing. I think he was ruling in Europe, in Ireland somewhere. Like I say, I, I, I didn't study this close last night, but the best I remember, so don't hold me to it, he was ruling in Ireland or in Europe somewhere, and his name is different. There, it, starts up, it starts with a Z. And see, the remnant that came out of Babylon was what Jesus, he had to, had to have to be totally pure with Ezra and Nehemiah that could brought about it. They couldn't bring anyone with them out of Babylon that had, not, that had intermarried, are in, because from that seed would come the Messiah. They had to be totally pure. And, and no one could come over to back to Israel if they had buried, intermarried. Okay, so that group came over. And at some time in history, when this prince was born from a daughter grandson, some, somewhere down the line, somewhere in history. He's ruling in Europe, but he sent over someone that was in Israel who helped and, and so that the Jews would not be wiped out again. He was in the right place at the right time. Sometimes after Ezra and then like through the centuries later, See, from Zedekiah, the Lord told Zedekiah, that was part of his curse, that no one from his bloodline would ever be king over Israel again. And see, Jesus came from the Judah, from, from David's bloodline. Not from Hezekiah, I mean, uh, Zedekiah. Even though it was just a different tribe. Anyway, I'll have this all maybe straight as straight as I can get it because some of it's sledging. It's still there. According now, there again, I studied this 2009, so we're going back. You know how much of this am I remembering? Don't don't anybody tell me I'm losing my memory. <laughs> <laughs> No, you had the mind of Christ. I have the mind of Christ. I studied this in 2009. That stone's still there. But I have, I, have, I have no notes on it, so we'll go into 43 next week and we get into it. But I love it because it's how God interacts with all these kingdoms. 
for his purposes. For his purposes. Hmm. Well, I had fun even with the rain. Mm-hmm. Y'all have trouble concentrating? No. No. Okay, now we gotta turn this baby off. It's blinding me. Push, button, push it at the end. End. Push at one of the ends, whichever. One Keep pushing. Off. Keep pushing. One off. The other one. The other side. The other side. Okay. Oh, there you go. Got it. You got it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, that's handy. Usually I don't have a time. I'll have a problem with this light in here. But, yeah. Mm-hmm. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sandra. I've got to put a little prop in.